All right, well, we, we will be in the book of Luke today, chapter 1, uh, once again. <clears throat> Frog in my throat. We're going to pick up on verse 26 today, though. Book of Luke, chapter 1, we're going to pick up on verse 26 and read down to verse 38. Once again, we're going to be continuing in the part of the Christmas story. Book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 26. Very familiar portion of Scripture. Say amen. 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 All right, let's see what God's word has to say to us this morning. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of, for her who was called barren. But with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. How many times have we read the Christmas story? How many times have we heard sermons, countless sermons on Christmas about the Christmas story? Never, never let it go idly by you and take it for granted. Everything because you've heard it so many times. We hear things so many times in this world. We've heard it since we were young. We hear so many things. Even before you were a Christian, most of us... People, they know the Christmas story. They've heard it over and over. They've seen movies. They've seen plays. They've heard it. They've talked about it. But do we take it for granted? I think we do many times. It, we, it's just, you know, second nature. We've heard it so many times. Now, last week, we looked at unbelief. We also looked at doing what you're supposed to do and being where you're supposed to be in life. And how that changes things. But this week as we look at the Christmas story, we're going to kind of head in a different direction. We're going to go a little bit, a little bit different direction. Now this is the second week of Advent. Now we're going to be looking at what I like to call the mystery, the mission, and motivation of God. You know there is a mystery to God. I praise God for that. I'm going to get to that too. There's a mission of God, and God is motivating. When, oh my. The creator of the universe, when he is motivated, things happen. Think about it. He's always motivated. It's not like me. Sometimes I am, sometimes I ain't. You know, sometimes you know, it just depends what day it is. But God is motivated. And there's a reason and there's a purpose behind it. The thing with Advent is for us to prepare our hearts <coughs> for the coming of Jesus. You know he's going to come back one day. You know We know that he was born and, and, and he died on the, uh, on the cross for our sins, but one day he's going to come back. Amen. We need to prepare our hearts. As we look at our Messiah, I say our Messiah, we see a truth that you can't get away from. Now this sounds going to sound simple, but I think we overcomplicate things sometimes. You know, sometimes theologians like to use these great big words and this and that. Well, I'm a simple kind of guy. I like to simplify things. And something that you can't get away from, I just like to look at it this way. Jesus was different. He was different than anybody that you're ever going to meet in your life. He was the only person, I've heard people refer this way, the only 200% person. He was fully God, but he was also fully human. 
There is nobody else like him, never been born before, nor will there be another one. Amen. He was the only Savior this world is ever going to have. He was different. I just, you know, I like to look at it. Jesus was different. Christianity is structured different than every, every other religion. You've all heard the same stuff I've had. Aren't all religions the same? All this stuff is basically the same thing. We're all good. Yeah, they all lead to heaven, right? Now, you've heard it. You've heard that stuff. It's not true. It's not true. All paths don't lead to heaven. They don't. There is only one way. Jesus said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is one way to heaven. What I see sometimes in Christians, they start listening to all this nonsense and it kind of creeps into their life. Next thing you know, they're believing that stuff. It can creep into the very best of us. Christianity is structured differently. In every other religion, I don't care what religion you name, humanity, mankind, we had to make our way to, the, to, your, to your God. I say your God. I didn't say the God to your God. You know, you can make anything a God. You had to make your way to them. That's not what happened in Christianity. God made his way to us. It was, it's entirely different. It's much different. It's structured different. Can you imagine that? You know, if I didn't believe in the creator of the universe, just say I had a God, I would have to make my way to that God. With all my problems and all my sin. To only just say you finally did make it to your God, not the God. When you got there, they couldn't do anything about what their problems were. They couldn't uh, forgive you of your sins. They couldn't do any of that. After you went to all the trouble to get there, they couldn't do anything about it. But that's not like our God. That's not the God I serve. He made his way to me. Who, who are we that he would come to us? Amen. Think about that. He came to us. He didn't have to do it, but then again, he did have to do it because we, a lot of times we just won't put the effort into it. God, God's got to do all the heavy lifting because we wouldn't have done it. He had to make it easy for us because he knows us. If it's difficult, we're not going to do it a lot of times. <laughs> I, was, I don't know about this. But see, God, he knew that we needed a Savior, so he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he knew that we needed a way for forgiveness of sins because of all the Old Testament ways, which I'm not going to touch on all that, but it wasn't working. He said that, you know, we need something different. He gave us hope. He gave us hope. You know, you've got to always have hope that one day things are going to get better. If you just sat there in the corner and just said, this is it, nothing's ever going to change, what would life feel like? It's no fun when you, if you get to a point like that. With the birth of Jesus, it was a game changer. It, it really was. We no longer had to make our way. Jesus made a way for us. <coughs> I don't know about you, but that was good news for me and it's good news for you. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, with the birth of Jesus, God came to us. Yeah. We've heard this many times, but think about it. We sit down and really think about that. <coughs> you know, I believe God's kind of busy at times. But yet he took the time to make his way to us. I always said, if you want to see something get done, give it to somebody who's busy. <laughs> because if somebody's not doing nothing there's a reason they ain't doing nothing mm -hmm. give it to somebody who's busy and they get it done usually yeah. they might, it might be a whole thing going on but they somehow manage to get it done yeah. I love that there's a mystery to God that means I don't understand everything if there's a mystery I don't understand everything in a mystery and I like that when something's a mystery and I don't understand everything that tells me I serve a great God because if I could understand everything of God, that means he's limited. Right. If, if, if God is limited to my thinking and I can understand everything he's doing, I, I, he's not God. Because surely the best and the brightest of us, whoever that may be, the truth is we can't comprehend the vastness of our creator. He has no beginning and he has no end. 
He doesn't have a beginning as we would know it. There are some things that are, that are it's just a mystery. You know, some people want all the answers. I've got to have all the answers before I believe. You're not going to have them. Some things you just, you just got to believe. There's always enough shadows for those who doubt, but there's always enough light for those who want to believe. Amen. You know, I, that, was, that was a quote from somebody. I can't remember who it was. I think it was Blaine, uh, Blaine somebody. I can't remember. It wasn't in my notes, so. You know, if you want to believe, you will. If you don't, you can, you can explain the Bible through and through, and they're still not going to believe. That is their choice. The Incarnation. That's kind of hard to believe. There's a mystery to that. How is that possible? How is that possible, Pastor, that somebody, she says she had never known a man. How is that possible? There's a mystery there. Some things you just got to take by faith. You're not going to understand everything. If you're waiting for all the answers, they ain't coming. Not all of them. There's some things that we just don't need to know. But somehow we think we're entitled to them. God, I want some answers. I'd be careful demanding of anything of God. Amen. I'd be careful. Nothing wrong with asking Him things, but demanding, that's a, that's a completely different story. Now, the incarnation and the context, you've got to always take everything into context. Everything in life, everything in Scripture, it's got to be taken in context. When the, when the Scripture is talking about the incarnation, it basically means in the flesh. In the flesh. So that tells me at this moment in time, God's plan for redeeming his people is revealed to us. That's important. Who are we that God would reveal anything to us? You know, when God, his whole plan all along, the whole Christmas story, it's about redeeming his people. His people. We belong to him. He wants to redeem us. Not one person that I could ever think of would come up with the idea of how the Messiah came to this earth. I wouldn't have planned it that way. Somebody, if God told me, you can write the script on how my son is going to come to the earth. I wouldn't have picked it that way. I would not have picked him to be born in a manger with animals. I would not have picked a lot of things that happened to him. I would have rolled out the red carpet. We would have had the very best. But God had a plan. He did it in His way, in His timing. Our plans don't always come to pass because they're not in God's will. But God does have a plan. And He has a purpose for us. Jesus' birth fulfilled the old prophecies. If they go, you go one by one through them, Jesus is the only person that ever fulfilled all those prophecies. That is amazing to me. The Hebrew people, they kind of fascinate me sometimes. But then again, if I look at my own life, I probably fascinate my own self with some of the things I believed and didn't believe. And, you know, sometimes you ever look at your own life and say, what in the world was I thinking at that point in time in your life? Get back to the Hebrew people just for a minute. The Hebrew people, they had waited in great anticipation for the Messiah for so many years. He's came and gone. And he's going to come again, and they're still waiting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some people that are foolish enough to say that Jesus never existed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You can go through people that are not Christians, historians, and they'll agree that there was a man named Jesus. Now, there's, now the debate comes in whether he was the Son of God. Now, we know where that goes. We know the truth. Mm -hmm. But there's debate. The Hebrew people... They say, no, no, there was a man named Jesus, but he wasn't the Son of God. We're still waiting on him. They've missed the boat. Yeah. They have missed the boat along the way. God did it in his way, in his timing, and they didn't understand it. They didn't see it. How could it possibly be one of us? You know, somebody that, you know, in my time, you know, we, we always think, you know, what great things can happen, but not to me. Great things can happen, but not to anyone I know. I hear God's great stories of God moving, but, oh, not with me or my family or in my church. Maybe somewhere else. We always think it has to be somewhere else. And maybe that was part of the Hebrew people, what they, what they were experiencing. <coughs> I do know this. God is not a faraway de deity that 
that demands that we come to Him. He came to us. And I find, like, find that simply amazing. Many times we scoff at things, and why is that? Because we don't understand them. And I don't think the Hebrew people were understanding what God was going to do. They knew what He was going to do because it was foretold in the Old Testament, in the Old, in the old Prophecies. But they didn't understand how He did it. When we don't understand something, we label it, you know, it must not be true. If I can't understand it or it's not the way I thought it should be, obviously this is not, this is not of God. We need to be careful because God's going to do it in His way any time that He so pleases. He is God and He does not have to answer to a one of us. Amen. This is all part of the mystery of God. I love that there's a mystery. If I could understand God fully... For some reason, somehow, that would scare me to death. It would scare me to death. Everything that God does has a purpose. Why does God always have a purpose? Because He has a mission. When you have a mission and you know what, the, what you're going to be doing, you have a purpose. It's the same way with our life. Many times, you know what, uh, we should have a purpose in life because we know what our mission is. One day we're going to arrive on the other side. And God has given you a mission here while you're here. The mission behind the mystery has one purpose when it comes to God. And that is redemption. There's a redemption that, a story that God is trying to play out. Now, the redemption story with Jesus' birth, it may have had many other purposes that have been fulfilled. But don't make any mistake, the main purpose in Jesus' coming was to redeem his people. <clears throat> my throat this morning. There's always a primary purpose. There's nothing wrong with some side things in life, but you always got to remember what your primary purpose is. As a believer, you should know what that is. The word redemption, now, that's not a word that I use very often. I don't use that in my regular vocabulary. I mean, I can't think I went to work and said, you talked about redemption. I can't, I can't just don't use that word very seldom. Now, if you look up the word redemption, it, it means this. It says the action of regaining or gaining possession of, possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. If that isn't Jesus, I don't know what is. Clearing a debt reclaiming something, gaining possession of. That is Jesus speaking into our life like, I, I, like, I, like crazy to me. God did something for ourselves. I said it a thousand times. I'll say it again. He did something for, our, for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And that is save us. And that was God's primary purpose. Jesus' birth and eventual, eventual crucifixion paid the debt of sin. I wouldn't have planned it that way. I'd have just said, okay, God, just go ahead and, you know, you can do it. You're God. But there's a purpose and a plan because there, he had a mission. He has a purpose. And I'm glad he does. Because sometimes we, we, we get off mission. We forget our purpose. We think we have no purpose. I don't even know why I'm here, Pastor. I'm just waiting. I'm just trying to get through life. It's so difficult. I forget, I have forgotten my purpose. Remember, God has a purpose for your life, and He, ha and he has a mission for your life. There, there, there's, a, there's a plan that's been set in motion long before for your life. God has never forgotten you, not once. All the hardships, all the problems, all the things, God hasn't forgotten you once. The scripture tells us that the word became flesh. Now, we know the word here to mean, in this context, to mean Jesus. I look, when, I, when I'm thinking about the things of God, and I'm thinking about our world, I'm like, how different are they? I was thinking about our government. I try not to too much. I hurt, make my head hurt. But uh, I was thinking about our government. And I was thinking, how easy is it for somebody to sit in a far distant place, not too distant from us, but in a distant place, and they make rules and regulations 
You know, they know they're going to affect people, but you don't know these people. You know, you're just making rules and regulations in general, and you're sending them out, our government does. And then we've got to abide by them because they said so. <coughs> How easy for that? It's easy to do that, right? Because you don't know the people that, that they're affecting, really. Like, that's so much different than our God. You know what? God, you know, there is things that He expects us to do and not do in life. It's not about rules and regulation, but there are things He expects us to do and not do. But the thing about it is, He doesn't stay distant. He came close to us. And that was through the birth of His Son, Jesus Christ. He came close to us. It, it was personal to, him, personal to Him. It's different. It's much different than this world. You know, where our government is just some distant thing. God is not like that. God came close. It's much different. God takes it personal. The thing is that each of us here know that God came close with the birth of his son Jesus. As he's trying to draw near to us, the question that arises to me is, are we drawing close to him? Are we drawing close to Him? The thing about it is God has given us every opportunity. He did all the heavy lifting. God has had a mission all along. As I looked at the mission of God this week, I came to the conclusion that the motivation of God had to be love. Amen. Think about it. It had to be love, the motivation of God. <clears throat> what motivated Him? It had to be love. What other reason? Right. You know, God can... Make it without us, right? He doesn't need us. He doesn't. He doesn't need us. He created us, but he doesn't need us. We need him. So his motivation had to be love. Advent is the proclamation of God's love for his people. God's love is more than sentiment, and it's, it, it's more than good intentions. God's love is different. God's love is active and overflowing love. It's much different. God love risks it all. God was motivated by love. It's driven by love. Now, let me just say this. When your motives are right in life, how you approach things change. Anything that you're motivated by, it changes how you approach it. When you go to work tomorrow, how you approach it, your motivation is going to determine what happens tomorrow. Not whether your work is good or bad or the people you deal with. Are you motivated? It's hard to be motivated sometimes. Let's just be honest about it. When you have to deal with difficult people, it's hard to be motivated. Now tomorrow you say, well, I don't go to work tomorrow. I'm this or that or whatever. Whatever it is that comes your way and how you approach it, how you're motivated by it is going to change everything. You see, God was motivated by love and it changed how he approached us. How we go about things. How we approach people. How we're motivated. Some of us are not motivated by very much. How can we, as flesh and blood, model what Jesus did for us? My thought is being an active participant. Now, I know... That not one of us here can go out and did what, do what Jesus did and die on the cross for somebody else's sin. Mm -hmm. No one else can do that except Jesus. <laughs> but you can model the rest of his life. You just go out and did what somebody else did for you. And that person is Jesus. When in doubt, it would surprise you what Jesus, what God can do with a willing vessel. Look at the story that we read in the scriptures today. Mary. We're talking about a teenage girl. What did Mary have to say? What did Mary say? Then Mary, then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In other words, she was willing. God used a teenage girl to play a part in changing the whole world. A teenage girl. Come on now. I think, I think we've got some people in here more motivated than a teenage girl. It's hopefully, right? <laughs> a teenage girl played a part in changing the entire world. 
But yet we think that we can't do anything. When you're motivated and you're willing, it's amazing what God can do in your life. Now keep in mind that God wants to move in your life. That sounds good, right? But are you willing? But are you willing? It sounds good, but are you willing? <clears throat> now one day we're all going to leave this earth. That's a no-brainer. We all know that. One day we're all going to leave this earth. What kind of legacy are you going to leave? I'm not talking about stuff. I'm not talking about everything you've accumulated, whether it's a little bit or a lot. I'm not talking about that. What kind of legacy are you going to leave? I've been with many people as they breathe their last breath, been their last days. And the two things that I hear the most is, I wish I had lived more for God, and I wish I had spent more time with family. Amen. That is what I hear almost 95% of the time. That's pretty much what I hear. Then why don't we live like that now? I think many of us are afraid to fail. We're afraid to fail at anything. I'm going to say this right up front. I would much rather deal with failure in my life than to deal with regret. Because to me, failure means I tried. I didn't succeed, but I tried. Regret means I never even moved. Now I'm dealing with the regret that I didn't even try. I'd much rather fail. Some people have laughed at me because I've failed at certain things in life. It's okay. They're not laughing anymore. Amen. It, don't get over it. Move on. Mm -hmm. Failure simply means I tried. Regret means I never did. I don't want to be at the end of my days dealing with all the what if. You say, well, I don't know what I could do now. This, look, you're still here. You still have a purpose. God's grace is still flowing. As long as, his, long as the air is still flowing through your lungs, God's grace is still flowing. How can I make a difference in this life? Do what Jesus did for you. Go make a difference in somebody's life. You, now, you can't do exactly what Jesus did, but I tell you this, you can make a difference in somebody's life. We've been doing that here a lot lately at the church. Look at all the families we've adopted. Look at all the, the shoe boxes, all the different things we've been doing. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, making a difference in somebody else's life. You don't have to know that person to make a difference in their life. When our motivation comes from God, there is no hurdle that you're not going to be able to clear. Every believer who calls himself a Christian has the same calling to engage in God's mission. At some point in level, you're called to engage in God's mission. You know, God's love towards us calls for a response. There are far too many people, they don't respond to anything. I'm just waiting. I know one day when I get to heaven, I'm a believer, I'm going to be in heaven. Praise God, I'll see you there. Amen. But what about until? We're all still here. That means God still has work. It calls for a response. Many people, they just hope that something goes by, oddly goes by. If I don't say anything, maybe somebody else will do it. Come on now. Maybe somebody else will do it. I'm just going to sit here and see if anybody else says anything first. You know what? There are people here that knew me before I was a pastor. I was saved. But I, I, I didn't wait for somebody else to volunteer first. I tried to be the first in line. Because I didn't want nobody else to get my blessing. I wanted it. <laughs> I wanted it. That, that means getting my hands dirty or whatever else meant to be. I was going to be the first in line. I wasn't going to stand around waiting for somebody uh, moping around and all that. I'm going to miss my blessing because somebody moping, not me. Amen. You can ask the people who knew me then. And people say, oh, you do it because you're the pastor. I have nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with my relationship with Jesus. Amen. That's what it comes down to. It's not about pleasing anybody else or you know, uh, you know, trying to show that I can do this or that. There's a lot of things I've failed at, but I'm going to try. I'm not going to sit around and wait for somebody else. That's ridiculous. I don't know why we get into that mindset sometimes. But many times, we, what do we do? We just sit around and let the moment pass. I'll, maybe next time. 
Maybe God calling you this time. God calls for a response. Of the countless funerals that I have done, of young and old, I did the ages run the gamut. You know what? They no longer have a chance to respond. They don't have a chance to respond anymore. Their faith has become sight. Whatever that is, whether they were a believer or not, whatever they put their faith in, their faith has become sight. But as I look at you here today, you know what? You still have a chance to live out your faith. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. We get one life here. We get one shot. When it's over here, it's over here. And you're going to go on to the other side somewhere. Don't miss out. You have an opportunity. Life is short. It can, in a blink of an eye, it can be gone. Don't take for granted and say, well, i got many more years yet. You don't know that. You may, but you don't know that. Don't miss out on the opportunity God has given you to respond with every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're here today and you need to be saved. There's no shame in that. Everyone has to have that day of salvation. Pastor, you can make this call all the time. Yeah, I'm going to continue to do it. Because I don't know your heart. I know you, but I don't know your heart. I don't go home with you. You know, only you, you 